This is a more unusual video than usual. With the Christmas holidays and the end of the year getting closer, I sometimes get these waves of nostalgia. I think about the years that passed, the people I met, the people I lost, and the things that moved in front of us. Maybe disappearing forever, maybe becoming something bigger, or maybe simply still being here with us. A few nights ago, during a trip through the web archive, I found myself rereading the blogs I used to follow 20 years ago. And as I kept scrolling through posts from 2006, I got a flash, a kind of illumination. You know that moment when, in your mind, images start composing themselves and moving like a cinematic sequence? Exactly like that. So I tried to translate that amazing journey into something more concrete and structured. Because by analyzing an author from that time, we can deeply understand the soul of our ecosystem. What moved us, what excited us, what mobilized us, what made us angry, what we loved to an absurd degree. Before I continue, let me pay tribute to Polycock. Polycock was an Italian blog about Linux and open source. Adventures in the world of open source was its motto, the motto that I personally took inspiration from. Behind Polycock there was Felipe, a blogger who, in a short time, became one of the most well-known figures not only in Italy, but followed internationally as well. His way of making content was special, never boring. He could make even a simple shadow on a window or a new font feel interesting. It was genuinely fun to read him. His titles were original, the images too, and then the text itself. Well written, not too long, essential but rich, personal but not too personal, exceptional but never snobbish. Basically, a masterpiece of writing style. He was my daily source of Linux. Back then there were no YouTubers. There were bloggers, more authentic figures, more genuine, completely free of commercial logic. You didn't end a post by saying, please comment, help me with the algorithm. There was no subscription. At most, there were RSS feeds. I miss blogs. I miss that textual way of consuming content, where you were actually encouraged to write, not just to comment. There was deeper participation. You read every single comment, 300 of them from start to finish, and then you replied to the most meaningful ones or the most contradictory ones. Another world, another internet. Linux was still a teenager, can you believe it? Nobody knew what would happen or what our ecosystem would become. Gnome and KDE were taking their early steps with Gnome 2 and KDE 3, and every single font, every new shadow on the windows became something shocking, news that lasted for days and spread like wildfire. We were all insanely excited about Compies. Compies felt like the future. You looked at it, and suddenly your Windows desktop felt 20 years older. Felipe himself became famous thanks to a guide on how to install Compiz on Ubuntu. Ah, right, Ubuntu, that Ubuntu. That was the most vivid and meaningful year, the turning point. Ubuntu Dapper Drake was spreading everywhere. It was disruptive. It was like breaking a dam and getting flooded with enthusiasm. We thought Linux had become for everyone, that it would finally spread and that at last, that would become the year of Linux. We were a tiny circle of users. I think less than one real percent of people, can you understand what that means? Still pioneers. We mattered, not this Unix porn stuff. Debian managed to be old even 20 years ago. Actually, it was much older back then than it is today. Absurd, right? It didn't even have Firefox. It used Iceweasel because of licensing issues on the logo. Unbelievable. And Firefox, yes, it was literally our untouchable myth. You heard that right. Firefox was our hero. Who didn't use Firefox? Very few people. And they were treated terribly. And if you criticized Firefox, you had to be careful. The browser was a legend, one of the most used browsers in the world. And we were all, more or less, proud of it. Proud to have it as a protector between proprietary systems and a web that on one side wanted to close itself to imprison us. And with hindsight, it succeeded. Look at how things changed in 20 years. There were no prescription lists, no political polemics or ideological battles. There were only massive technical flame wars. Barrel versus Compiz, for example. Please tell me someone here remembers Barrel. It was a healthier community, still fiery like today, but on things that actually mattered. Reading the comments, you didn't really see Arch users. You saw Gen 2 users. Yes, Gen 2 was still popular in 2005, very popular, more than it is today. 
and it was the distro of people who bragged about using a superior Linux. I'd call them the unaware victims of people with low self-esteem who need to prove their abilities to others. Looking at those posts, XGL, absolute madness. KDE always trying to reinvent the wheel, but KDE 4 looked like it came from another planet back then, at least in screenshots. Then when you compiled it, it was basically an alpha. And mono, mono was the big enemy, the thing that, in a way, today, could be rust for us, more or less. And I don't want rust supporters to go feral over this, but mono was seen as an invasion into our ecosystem by her, Microsoft, the one big ultimate enemy. My God, whatever happened to Miguel de Acaza? And yes, Compiz reminds me of Hyperland, and Mono reminds me of Rust. There was still no sign of System D back then, thank God, but in someone's mind it was already incubating, unfortunately. And then Ubuntu, 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 but a totally different Ubuntu. Even the word sounded different in your head when you said it. They shipped you free CDs, free, to your home, in any corner of the planet. Android was being born. We were always fighting with phones, and that has always been our Achilles heel. We always had useless programs that did useless things, but they felt absolutely fantastic to us. We are magnificent at that. I loved a column Felipe had called La Casata del Giorno, the daily bullshit, basically. A series where he showed things that looked useless, insignificant, but those were exactly the things that gave flavor to everything. File tagging, prehistoric stuff, Yes, even file search and classification was still at the dawn of time. There were few tools. On GNOME there were Tracker and Beagle, and I think on KDE they were developing Akhenati. But you're here to correct me, so do it if I'm wrong. And the distros made for noob tinkerers who want everything pre-chewed. They existed even back then. Listen carefully and strap yourselves to the chair. Gen 2 to try XGL and Compiz. My god, I could stay here all night just reading those comments. Felipe and I always had an obsession with elegance and resource usage, and also with the intrinsic beauty of the opposite sex. Do you remember Gimme? I honestly don't remember that project, but I can see a historical tendency in GNOME and its users toward docs, a primordial obsession, I'd say. A macOS abstraction implanted at birth. And in all of this, nobody cared about XFCE, just like today. Felipe, my friend, I surpassed you. What a satisfaction. And I discovered we invented before Apple the concept of rear touch. You just touch the side of the screen to activate the cube directly from Guadec. But do they still do Guadec? The future of the desktop really seemed to be heading toward 3D, the dynamism of objects, actual 3D interaction. There were other projects like that. We were just waiting for someone to implement it, to make it available and instead they remain simple mock-ups or experiments for their own sake. Sometimes when something feels imminent, it never happens. Strange, right? No, wait, I correct myself. KDE's counterpart to Beagle was called Strigi. There it is. And think about the little gems GNOME 2.16 had. I'll leave it there without comments. And even 20 years ago, there were waves of users switching to Linux. And pay attention. From Mac. History, as you'll see, is always the same. We are the ones who need to read it, interpret it, dig into it. Sorry if I laugh, but you should see me while I write. Look at this post, Fitz Law and KDE4. I quote it directly, and I'll take the time to translate it, hoping our beloved Felipe won't be offended. If he ever ends up burying this video in the depths of YouTube, here is an interesting read that shows how KDE devs are not insensitive to the laws that make a graphical interface usable. In this case, it's about applying to KDE for some simple principles derived from the insights collected in Fitz Law, complete with practical examples and small explanatory screenshots. One example, making toolbar icons bigger and therefore easier to click, as shown in the image next to it. And sorry, the image is not recoverable anymore. And again, compass, compass, compass. Felipe was interested in GNOME preferences that would be rationalized. Well, with hindsight, only the rationalization remained and they removed the preferences entirely. This one is epic, improving DVD and video rendering under XGL. What do I know? Using MPV's new rendering engine that is smudgy and insane, that's what it would sound like today. Ubuntu at the top also for security. Ubuntu was doing great, there's no denying it. Who hasn't loved it at least once? Who beats who? Open source versus proprietary software. 
These are eternal classics, Felipe. This is a pearl. KDE and or Gnome, who wins? And above all, why? Let me quote just a piece, listen, translated literally. There are Gnome Talibans, strengthened by the multinationals investing billions into their DE, sure that the final victory will be theirs. Their motto is KISS, which some thought meant keep it simple stupid, but instead it's the acronym for KDE. But they'll never admit it, and by doing so they convince themselves, and convince us, that they have a superior DE, when it's simply that it doesn't allow you to make any choice other than turning off the PC. The gnome type is easily recognized by the fact that he removed an extra rear-view mirror from his car, fog lights, reverse gear, and for greater integration, coherence, and consistency, also the light that indicates reverse, maybe from the next version. Remove the back seat, the spare wheel, the cigarette lighter, and even the warning lights for faults. Because if a car works well, you can't understand why it should have faults to signal, and so on. I won't add anything else. KDE4, Strigi will be the new search engine. But in the end, Strigi was never really implemented. Or I think it changed name. I'm sure someone will clarify it in the comments. Compies, compas, and compas. Then, GTK app window, the menu bar for GTK GNOME, continues. Yes, a story older than 20 years. Grand news from NVIDIA, support for AI Galex. Yes, truly grand news, shattered optimism, I'd say. As you can see, forms of aggression toward people who created content have always existed, and especially from people who create content. You just pretend they don't exist, and you move on. Look at this. OpenGL compositing in Quinn first real effects. Yes, they put the cube in and took it out at least five times. More than 20 years have passed and they still haven't decided. Without more limits, false. And what was a joke, a fun April Fool's, became reality. And then Ubuntu, Compiz, Color Schemes, anti susie and Novell Battles, the usual NVIDIA drivers, propagandistic posts that, as a more mature and intellectually evolved person, I can now interpret. Praise for a torrent client. I think Deluge is dead, right? And then Novel's very peaceful installer and KHTML. A great project we all hoped would become the next big open source thing in browsers. And instead it gave a browser engine to Apple in the end, while KDE's engine is basically dead. I adored Conqueror. It was my favorite program, even if not exactly aligned with KISS philosophy. But what truly entertains me about this is reading the comments. Yes, there were aggressive comments, but they still had a logic, a thread, a different grammar, a different way of expressing themselves. There was an unwritten netiquette that nobody dared to break, or you'd get bullied. Grammar mistakes, abbreviations, were not appreciated. Yes, we were all a bit grammar n. It was a different world, a different internet, different users. It wasn't an exact projection of reality. There were no neon lights, memberships, drop me a like. A like was earned by making content worthy of it, making people think, informing them. But then, thinking about it, the actors changed, but it's not like it changed that much compared to today. The dynamics are always the same. Maybe it's a less pure world now, less oriented toward free software and licenses, and more toward politicization and commercialization. A world of microphones and camera angles and night lives and terminals behind your shoulders. A world of memberships, sponsor, Sorry, let me have this moment of regression. So what do I perceive from that time about 2026? What answers can I find in 2006 that will still be valid for all of us tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow? One thing is certain. Hyperland and tiling managers have changed the Linux desktop forever, definitively. And I'm not sure Hyperland will still exist in 10 years, but I'm sure GNOME, KDE, and something else will be totally different. This time it really feels like the fateful year of Linux has arrived. Yes, we will grow more and more, and I don't think it will only be a good thing. If today I'm already seeing Zorin OS and that $50 trash, well, I expect even worse tomorrow. But I also expect that someone will manage it, and manage it for real, to create a commercial version of Linux with at least a minimum of ethics, of coherence with the values of the community and of open source. I don't know if Rust will have the same fate as Mono. We're probably all in hype, in a way. The mere fact that we mention it even negatively confirms that thesis. Maybe we simply won't talk about it anymore. Fragmentation will increase, but not in the way we think. 
Specific programs will multiply, specific models, Linux tools will refine, evolve. 20 years ago, there weren't 100 terminals. Maybe in the future, the focus will shift elsewhere toward containerization tools, more accessible web apps. It will be an infinite, highly specialized ecosystem. Windows will remain a basic mass desktop, but everything else will run Linux. At least that's what I see. I miss a browser, and I hope that in a few years I won't feel the pain I feel now when I think of Firefox 20 years ago, and then look at Firefox for what it is today. Maybe Ladybird will save us. In the end, it's in history that we find answers to the questions the future will ask us. And that's why I took a trip back into 2006, and I hope I made you relive those same emotions. The sound of the computer booting, the modem making noise, those dim evenings in front of the screen, and Firefox with 80 tabs open. How beautiful that was. But you know what? Once this writing is done, the best part will be coming back here into the present and reliving these nights spent writing for you. For me, nights that I hope will be memorable one day for someone else, just like Felipe's were memorable for me. And going back to Felipe, if you ever watch this video, and if you ever manage to reach the end, and I'm not sure you will, considering the chronic abandonment rate of the dominant click spasm culture, I want to tell you I condemn you for only one thing, your sex. Because if you were a woman, well, I would have sent you huge bouquets of flowers and written endless romantic poems. But since you're Felipe, you have a beard, a child, and maybe a belly now, I'll just say thank you. And yes, in 2006, there was no political correctness, and you could write things like that without someone feeling disturbed. Thank you truly, from the heart. And may fortune be with you in your life. Thank you, my friend.